Welcome to the Center for Latino Policy Research. I'm Lisa Garcia Loya, the chair of the center. Thank you all so much for joining us today on such a beautiful afternoon for our last event of the, of the semester. So we wish you all a happy summer. Um, I will be quick today in introducing. I know it's summer. No, no. Not quick system, I know. Not, yeah. um, not, not at UCLA. <laughs> yes. Yes, but in August, yeah. you can yeah. you can look. Yeah, exactly. But uh, so we have the pleasure of having Patricia Gandara with us today, and introducing her is Russell Rumberger, who's the vice Pro provost for educational programs at UCOP. Um, he's also a professor of education at Santa Barbara, and has run a number of important centers within the University of California, including the Linguistic Minority Research Institute, which unfortunately is now no longer in existence, but did some very important research on that. And without further ado, I will introduce Vice Provost Rumberger. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, just, I just ran over here from Utah because I said, for a friend, you do almost anything, right? So, but this is a really good friend and, and colleague that we actually became close colleagues working on LMRI together for 10 years. So I was the director and she was the associate director and I literally could not have done it without her. And I think we learned a lot uh, about, about, well, about each other, but also I was thinking about running centers and about influencing policy and all that stuff. And that's really, um, if I had to characterize Patricia uh, in this nexus between being a scholar and being an activist, you know, if it, she's, she's great at both, and it's a kind of unusual combination among faculty. I'm sure many of you have had professors who can inspire you and teach you and do all these great things that professors can do. But I think many professors are not in, as uh, either willing or inept in, in actually making a difference in practice, <coughs> especially at the policy level, which is what Patricia uh, has done over, the, over her career, and especially over the last 10 or 15 years that I've <coughs> known her. And we've done some of this work together, but she's, she's a tireless advocate for those of you that know her. And I think the unique uh, position that she plays that very few scholars can play is she brings research knowledge to bear on these important policy issues, which we need to do if we're going to affect policy change. You know, you really have to have, have, have knowledge and research as a, as a weapon to fight uh, your fight. And she brings that knowledge to bear. She, she commissions work. I think she's going to talk about that today. And, and we did that as well at LMRI. And we commission work that's, that is uh, focused on policy issues as well as try to do your own work that's focused on policy issues. So she is a, is a great scholar and she's a great advocate and a successful advocate, I have to say, both at the national and state levels in bringing this research knowledge to bear on these important problems and, and advocating really strongly for Latino students and English learners um, who need you know, all the advocacy we can give them. Um, we know the status uh, of, that they play in our education system, the important role that they're going to play in terms of their population growth, and yet in many ways are shortchanged in the educational system. So we need advocates like Patricia to, uh, to fight the fight and to bring the research knowledge to bear. So I'm really happy to, again, have her as a colleague and a friend, and uh, she'll inspire you if, she, if you haven't heard her before, and I'm happy to be here to introduce her. Patricia. Thank you. Controversial issues, you know, that you get into, and yet you still end up loving each other. So that's been a wonderful association. So you can see here <coughs> that uh, the title is different than what was advertised because when I was asked to come up with the title, it was long before I had really thought exactly of what it was that I wanted to say today. So I'll be saying similar things, but. Um, but the title's a little different, and you will find out why uh, this title. Uh, will we all be Arizona? Hornby Flores and the Future of Language Policy. Um, and also, thank you for so many friends who are here. It's just it's really, really nice. I, 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 miss, I miss the North State, and I miss the Bay Area, and it's just really very nice to see folks. Um, <clears throat> but I want to talk about uh, in part, is a case that we were very much engaged in in the Civil Rights <coughs> Project for a, about a year and a half. But that case is part of a longer story, and I'm going to try and tell a little bit of that story uh, along the way. Why does Hornby Flores matter so much, particularly if you haven't even heard of it before? Why is this worthy of a, a, 
well, not only a talk here at Berkeley and at other places around the country, but there will soon be several books coming out on this, too. Why? Um, because, in part, while well, nobody was paying attention, you know, the, not only the nation, but internationally, eyes were focused on Arizona with SB 1070, with the ethnic studies <coughs> issues in Tucson, with a whole series of things that were flooding, you know, the media around Arizona's anti-immigrant stances. Well, in the midst of all of that, there was a case going on, a case called Horn de Flores, that I would argue is perhaps more important than any of those things that you were actually hearing about <coughs> in, the press and in the media. Because Horn de Flores is the single most important decision to have been made. This was a Supreme Court decision. The single most important thing to happen since 1974 in Lau v. Nichols, which was the first Supreme Court decision that actually spoke to the rights of English learners. And this changed a lot. And we're going to see very soon just how much it's going to change. So while no one was paying attention to this, um, major things were happening in Arizona that will resound across the country. So first let me do a little bit of background for those of you who don't study these things every single day and sort of know them by heart. Um, ten and a half million students speak a language other than English at home. These are linguistic minority kids. Um, that's about 20% of the entire national student population, K-12, in the public schools. This is huge. This is not, a, like I sometimes say, a boutique issue. This is something that affects all of us because it's affecting all of our schools. Um, and too many of our students, particularly in the Latin <coughs> community. Sometimes I think there is a tendency to believe that, well, if we just seal the borders, this will, you know, th these numbers will go way down. Let me come to that in just a second. More than five million of these ten and a half million students are labeled English learners at any given moment. So these are kids who five million, actually it's about 5.1 million right now, um, <clears throat> today don't speak enough English well enough to have main access to the mainstream um, courses. But that's only at one time, so that's about 10%, about 10% of all the kids across the country. Uh, but that's at one time, because I really think that that figure of 10 and a half million, that 20% of all students, is a far more accurate way of thinking about it, because these kids are on a continuum of learning English. And so once they get reclassified as English speakers, which means they just got over the threshold on a test, they didn't they didn't immediately become fluent and, and able to access everything. They're still on a pathway to that. So the 10% or 5.1 million is a real underestimate of the students we're talking about. One in five students in the United States is an immigrant or the child of immigrants. We have just been going through the, in terms of absolute numbers, the largest immigration in the history of this country. Proportionally, slightly, slightly, barely less than we did at the last turn of the last century, but we have been through a massive uh, immigration, and it has changed the face of the nation. But what's important for people to know is that about 75%, you know, and I keep changing that because things are changing so rapidly. Alex, I don't know if you have a, uh, have a more recent number, but it's gone from 80 to 70 to two-thirds to 80. Uh, but about three-quarters of these students that we call English learners who are still on, in the process of learning English are native-born. They are citizens here of the United States, and they have every right and privilege that is accorded to citizens. The other 25% have Plyler v. Doe, the 1982 decision that Supreme Court decision that found that student K through 12 kids who were here, documented or not, uh, were to be provided with the same education as all other children. <clears throat> Almost 80% of these English learners speak one language, and that's Spanish. That's very important. The reason that that is so important is because it makes a very big challenge manageable. Oftentimes, uh, in districts where people don't really, uh-oh, 
where people don't really want to do. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't quite that right there. Um, oftentimes in districts where people don't really want to do anything about this issue, they'll say, oh my gosh, you know, I've got 47 different languages spoken in my district. How do you help, how do you expect me to deal with this? Well, yeah, you may have a lot of different languages represented, but 80% of them probably, and in California more than that, more like 90% of them are Spanish speakers. And this is not a real hard nut to crack. So I'm giving you sort of a national picture here. Okay? I'm not going to just focus on California. There are six states that account for the bulk of English learners in the nation. California, Texas, Arizona, New York, Florida, and Illinois. Those are the big states. More than 10% of their kids are English learners. And it's really in those states closer to 15 to 25 uh, percent of this. Um, the six have up to 15 percent, except for California, that has about 25 percent right now. It actually just recently went down to 24.3 or something. But a quarter of the kids in this state, at any given moment, are English learners. In other words, this state's future rests on how well we do with these kids, and they don't do well. So I'm going to give you, now, now what I want to do is I want to sort of build up to Arizona and what's going on in Arizona and why Hornby, Florida is so important. I want to do a short history of the rights of English learners. And I don't think I have, because they're coming. Anyway. <coughs> In 19, we, we could start the history, reasonably, uh, in terms of the legal history in 1964 with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. That barred discrimination based on national origin, and this was interpreted as including language. So in 1964, Title VI says you cannot discriminate against people on the basis of the language that they speak, and therefore these students who speak another language other than English have rights. They have rights to an education like anyone else in this country. Title VI would become the foundation for the Lau v. Nichols decision. Uh, Lau v. Nichols being the major Supreme Court case that originated here in San Francisco with Chinese-speaking kids, uh, in which they sued in a class action suit. Uh, sued the district um, for not providing an equal education for these English learners. In 1968, then, we haven't actually gotten to Lao yet, because Lao's going to be 1974, okay? In 1968, the next big step is Title VII of the Elementary Secondary Education Act, also known as the Bilingual Education Act. This establishes a role for the federal government to not just protect from discrimination, but to actively support the instruction for English learners. So now this is the federal government is involved now in providing some kind of additional services for these children uh, to ensure that they can, in fact, join the mainstream. Although it was called the Bilingual Education Act in 1968, it was the intent of bilingual education was never really defined in the act, and that was very purposeful. It was very politically purposeful. We're not going to really say what we mean by this, because we don't want to get too much flack, and we want to make sure this gets, gets the votes that we need. Uh, but that ends up being a problem, because now it's got to be defined at every point that there's uh, a renewal of the ESCA. You know, what do we really mean by bilingual education? <clears throat> okay, so now we move ahead uh, another six years, and this is the point at which we get Lauby Nichols, the first Supreme Court decision that actually speaks to the issue of the rights of English learners. Established the right to equal access to the same curriculum as other students. So the court came out uh, in Lau and said, okay, these English learners, if they don't speak English, it is the responsibility of the schools to provide for them access to the same curriculum that other students get. And the court goes on to say that no specific remedy is urged. They don't know 
exactly how this is supposed to happen. Bilingual <coughs> education may be one method. There may be others. So this is, again, left kind of vague here, how this is supposed to happen. But <coughs> weeks later, the Equal Educational Opportunity is Act is passed. And the EEOA then codifies LAO and says the EEOA, the Ed Equal Educational Opportunity Act, says that the uh, school districts are required to take appropriate action to overcome language barriers that impede equal participation by its students in the instructional program. So, a little bit more clarification, you've got to, you know, not discriminate, you've got to do something for these kids, and that something has to overcome those language barriers. But that's about where it ends. Then in 1982, the Fifth Circuit, Texas, <coughs> uh, in a decision, in a Fifth Circuit decision uh, called Castaneda uh, versus Picard, lays out what the criteria are for a program that indeed overcomes those barriers and takes appropriate action. And those criteria are that the program must be based on sound research, that the program must be implemented with fidelity, and after a period of time, unspecified, but after a period of time, must demonstrate success in doing this. Still silent on what kind of program, right? What you should know is that meantime the federal government is promulgating all kinds of regulations around this, and there is, after Lao uh, in 1974, there was a basic belief that bilingual education was probably the most reasonable way to do this, although the court didn't specify. Um, folks have a hard time imagining how we're going to provide equal access to the curriculum unless we provide it in a language that the students can understand, right? So there was an assumption that this is probably going to mean uh, bilingual education, but from the moment that Lao is decided and, uh, and it's codified in the EOA, from that moment there is a backlash against it and a, sort of a constant pummeling of the uh, federal regulations around it. But in any case, what I have pointed out to you is that between, between the 1964 Civil Rights Act and about 1975-76, we hit the high point in rights for English learners. In 1975-76, we have Title VI on the books. It says uh, you can't discriminate against this, these kids. We have Title VII on the books, the Bilingual Education Act that says you must provide affirmatively so that they have access. We have Lau v. Nichols that says you cannot discriminate against these children <coughs> in access to the regular curriculum. You've got to find a way. We have the EEOA, which will later specify with specific criteria. And bilingual education is assumed the viable, the most viable remedy. This is the high point of rights for English learners. From this moment on, I'm going to start showing you the unraveling of those. In the 1980s and the 1990s, we see an erosion of those rights. All those things that were fought for, uh, one after the next. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is known as NCLB today, okay, uh, almost each time, and without going into an entire history of the reauthorizations of this, uh, as a trend, we can say there are some little blips back and forth, but as a trend, there are increasing restrictions on bilingual education. And so each time that this legislation is reauthorized, there's a little bit more uh, chink in the armor, a little bit more foot in the door to uh, uh, say, well, maybe we're not really going to do bilingual education and allow for more and more English only, what they call alternative program instruction. There, so there was increasing support for English-only instruction over time, the 1980s and 90s. Um, in several years, declining funds to support these, uh, these programs. And then in 2001, 
with the reauthorization of ESCA, it now becomes No Child Left Behind, NCLB, the Bilingual Education Act disappears altogether. There is no more Bilingual Education Act. <coughs> now there is uh, Title III, and it's about, uh, it has to, Russ, I don't know if you, if these titles are so long, you can look equal educational acquisition, English acquisition act, something or other, something or other, but there is no longer any Office of Bilingual Education. There is no longer any sign on the door anywhere in the federal government that says bilingual education. Meantime, also, Title VI protections have been eroded over time. By 2001, in order to win a case in, in federal court, one had to show the intent to discriminate against an English learner. So disparate impact, the idea that um, you can win a case because students were uniformly and consistently being denied access to the curriculum wouldn't get you anything because unless you could show that there had actually been an intent on the part of the school district to do that. Well, intent is almost impossible to, uh, to prove. How do you... How do you prove what was in somebody's mind when they did something that was, well, gosh, we thought we were doing this in the best interest of the kids. So uh, that is a huge, huge uh, assault on Title VI. And then next, in another decision, um, the court finds that there is no private right of action <coughs> under Title VI. So now that means that uh, no single family, no single child can go and sue only an agency of the government can sue. So now, if you find that you know there is rampant discrimination, or you believe that's the case, if there is uh, an inability for these children to have access to the regular curriculum, they're not being provided for, uh, and it's your child, there is nothing you can do about that in the court unless you can convince an agency of the government to go in, which would basically be the Office for Civil Rights whose job it is to do that. Unfortunately, if you will think back to this period of time, we didn't have anybody in the Office for Civil Rights uh, who was interested in doing this kind of thing. We didn't have anybody in the government who was interested in doing this kind of thing. So effectively, Title VI was dead. Lau v. Nichols, which said you had to provide access to the curriculum, was on very shaky ground. So we have a Supreme Court decision that says this, but how do you get the rights if you don't have access to the courts and if your government doesn't want to go on your behalf? By 2001, with the Office for Bilingual Education gone, the Office for Civil Rights inactive, the strongest leg of the stool that is left is the Equal Educational Opportunity Act. And you recall that it said uh, there has to be appropriate uh, remedies and it has to meet these certain criteria. Um, that's what we've got left. So let me take you now to Miriam Flores, the state of Arizona, and where these two things are going to collide. In 1992, so we'll do a little bit more history again. In 1992, little girl in the fourth grade in Nogales School District named Miriam Flores and her family sue the district for uh, not providing an adequate education because uh, Miriam and other children, it was a class action suit, so other students similarly situated, sue saying that they're not getting, they're English learners, they're not getting access to the regular curriculum, they're doing poorly in school, and things are going very badly for these kids. Between 1992 and 2000, eight good years, the state, the, the district, and then the scores of the state <coughs> um, just drags its feet. This ends up, this, this, um, this, this case, by the way, has gone through various names because uh, it's best to refer to it as a Flores case because there have been different people who have been at the other end of this over time. But, the state drags its feet on this. Um, 
they uh, do all kinds of manipulations in the court so as not to really respond to it. Um, it begins really as an adequacy suit. Um, the issue is that the state is not spending enough money and sending it to Nogales to provide for these kids. And the state fights this one on a whole bunch of grounds. But it, it is kind of interesting for those of you who follow the adequacy stuff, but this begins as an adequacy, adequacy suit kind of ends up someplace else. So finally in 2000, after all kinds of court things, in the year 2000 there's a consent decree between the courts and the state of Arizona. And, uh, and Arizona is told, okay, <coughs> you need to demonstrate that you are doing well by these kids. You need to demonstrate that you are investing enough money in the education of English learners. So it's still at the level of an adequacy suit. You need to demonstrate you're investing enough money and that that money is actually related to the needs that these children have. So you can't just say, okay, we're putting an extra $15 in. You need to demonstrate that that's, that's the amount of money that these kids need. Um, and so the state commissions a couple of studies and we wait a few years on this and the state rejects all of the studies because uh, in both of those studies that they commission, the conclusion was that they weren't investing enough money in these kids. And so they complained about the methodology and said, well, this isn't really. So anyway, this drags on and drags on until 2005. Okay, in 2005, the federal court judge has had it. Okay, this has been going on since 1992. You guys have done nothing. Um, and if we begin with saying that if Arizona does not come to us within the next few weeks and show us demonstrate that you have in good faith been providing for these children, we are going to start suing the state of, uh, of Arizona, uh, fining them $500,000 a day. Arizona ignores it, and the court comes back and says a million dollars a day. I think by the time this is over, it's up to $2 million a day for refusing to address the court order. In 2006, then, the Arizona legislature, now under enormous pressure, because now we're at $2 million a day uh, for not responding to the court order. In 2006, the legislature in Arizona passes what's known as House Bill 2064. And this sets up a task force. So this puts things back on hold again for a little while. Sets up a task force that's supposed to look at this issue and uh, recommend what these kids need. They end up recommending that, um, that the children should be in a four hour block of segregated education with, uh, and during that four hours in which they are to be only with other children who do not speak English, at a similar level of uh, lack of fluency as themselves. Um, and during that four hours, they're supposed to follow what is called the STAR program. And this will be another interesting conversation in itself because where this comes from is all very, very weird. But it's basically four hours of drill, <coughs> and vocabulary, and then you know, uh, syntax, and pragmatics of edu uh, language. It's like this four hours of deadly drill. And they're very specific that it's not to include, it's not to include instruction <coughs> in any other area. So as a part of this, they're not supposed to be getting math or social studies or history or any of those things that all the other kids are getting, which really invokes loud, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't that make you kind of think, hmm, wasn't it loud that said they must have access to the regular curriculum? All right, the fight is on in Arizona. Uh, the super, superintendent in Arizona uh, public construction now is a man by the name of Tom Horn. And he goes to the appeals court and says he wants uh, relief from this, uh, from the court orders because things have changed in Arizona. And although they didn't bother to stop by the court and let them know that things had changed, in fact, they have lots of evidence now of changed circumstances that mean that this, uh, this court order really, really should not adhere anymore. 
appeals court uh, does not agree with them. <laughs> so you go back and pay for the education of these kids, and they appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, um, so in, I think it was February of 2009, we got the word. And this is, you know, for those of us who worry about the rights of English learners and immigrant kids, we've been tracking on this for quite some time. This was really an interesting case that was working its way around, and interesting that Arizona was getting away with this for so long. So in February of 2009, the Supreme Court says, we'll take the case. That sent shockwaves through the entire civil rights community in this country. Because why would the Supreme Court, a very conservative Supreme Court, want to take on a case from Arizona that's been dragging on for 15 years where they've just kind of been dragging the feet? Why would they want to do that? Well, civil rights lawyers, let me see if I tell you in this next one. Yeah, okay. Um, Civil rights lawyers all across the country concluded the only reason this court would want to take this on would be to gut the EOA. They could basically use this to, uh, for a decision that would take that last leg of rights away by saying that the EOA <coughs> does not apply here. And so the concern was, will there be no protections left? And the entire civil rights community was mobilized by this. The NAACP, the, uh, the Legal Defense Fund, MALDEF, I mean, every major civil rights organization in the country prepared an amicus brief in this, uh, in this, for this decision because everybody was at risk in this if they actually went after the EOA. Well, it turned out that in the decision that we got in June of, um, of 2009, so this was very quick, they took the case and we very quickly got a decision. Um, in that decision, they actually did not go after the EOA. They concluded that yes, um, Arizona <coughs> needed to comply with the EEOA, but that Arizona had in fact been in good faith. That poor Arizona had really been prevailed upon here in ways that was unfair because they were trying very hard to, uh, to uh, look out for the needs of these children and that it was not reasonable for the court to expect that there should be a particular relationship between <coughs> the amount of money that was being spent on these kids and the kind of education that was being provided. In other words, it was a harking back to money doesn't matter. What we need to see is how good of an education are these kids getting just because they're not spending money on them doesn't mean they aren't doing a bang up job of educating them. So the decision that we got in 2009 effectively decoupled the funding from programs for uh, children who are supposed to be protected. That, in fact, seriously weakens EDOA. Didn't, didn't totally take it away, but seriously weakens it for these kids and for all kids thereafter because that was just decoupled. But then they remanded other aspects of the case back to the federal court because of this claim that the state had made that there had been changed circumstances. So they sent it back to the federal court and they said, okay, we want you to look at these changed circumstances and the way to what extent the case, uh, the case has been made. This is the point at which we at the Civil Rights Project realized that there had to be intervention here. Um, this was going back to court, and I'll show you what questions were sent back. The remanded issues were uh, the following. In the decision of Hornby Flores, the court Justice Alito said that, well, one reason for finding Arizona not at fault is because they had gotten rid of an inferior program, that being bilingual education, and had imposed a superior, a significantly, quote, a significantly more effective means of instruction, structured English immersion. And that that in itself constituted a, 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 a response to the federal court. But 
wanted the uh, wanted <coughs> the court to go through this and clarify that that indeed had occurred. Um, one of the arguments that the lawyers had made, and this was the one that scared all of the civil rights attorneys, was that by complying with NCLB, that Arizona had been in compliance with NCLB, so that should trump uh, the EEOA. We don't need an EEOA if, um, if the state is complying with, um, with NCLB. So that was sent back for clarification about the extent to which they had, uh, they had complied with NCLB. They also, the court also <coughs> said that, um, that there had been marginal increases in statewide funding. And it was one of these issues about where uh, you know, uh, this would affect everybody, including English learners, since they're the state, you know, I mean, there's inflation, right? Uh, <laughs> they were paying a little bit more, for, more money for the education of kids, and so that must have had a positive effect on these kids. And that there had been some administrative reorganization in the Nogales schools, which is really, that's a real stretch. Um, so anyway, those are the issues that we're going back. It's at this point, particularly on that one thing that they have, that Arizona has instituted a, quote, significantly more effective program of instruction. And you will recall that that program of instruction is four hours of segregated education which the children have no access to the regular curriculum. And this is what the court's being asked to buy. We um, got a little bit of money, and there's a story in here too that I want you guys to pay attention to, okay? We got a little bit of money from the Foundation for Child <coughs> Development, because we have a friend there who cares about these issues. And she gave us enough money to pull together a meeting at UCLA that summer after the decision. And so we called in a number of civil rights attorneys, former OCR heads, um, a handful of academics, and the lawyer who would be the lead lawyer in this remanded case. And we spent a day discussing what issues would be at the core of that case and what research needed to be done in order to inform those issues. This was very much an academic research undertaking. What research do you, does a court need? We don't know how these studies will come out, but what is the kind of research that needs to be done in order to inform the court about whether these things are effective or not? So we came up with a strategy, and I have to say too that your uh, former uh, colleague here, Rachel Moran, was very important in this strategy too because it was Rachel who said, this has got to be about segregation. In good part, this has got to be about segregation because there is something really fundamentally wrong that the court will see when you're taking these kids out. And, you know, the argument in Arizona had been that, well, we take them out for four hours and we do this intensive um, English language development but they're reintegrated for the rest of the day. Well, the rest of the day ends up being about an hour and a half. And, uh, and we wanted to know, are they really reintegrated? How do you do that? How do you take kids out for four hours a day and then reintegrate them in? So that, of course, was one question that we had. You know, how effective is this program? Is it really significantly more effective? Okay, so we laid out the strategy. And we tried to answer the questions, is Arizona's policy harming English learner students? <coughs> Can English learner students become proficient in English as, A.B., I didn't tell you that, House Bill 2064, um, this four hour block, came along with that was the promise that these kids in this segregated setting would become fluent in English within one year. And so don't worry about it, guys, because we're going to do this for a year, and all these kids will be fluent in English, and then we'll... So that was another question. Are these children becoming fluent within a year? Is Arizona taking... I don't know why I did that. Oh. <coughs> Is Arizona really taking, quote, appropriate action? with this four-hour English language development class that segregates all students into what we very pointedly refer to as Mexican rooms. 
because this harks back to the history of Arizona when over time, this is the way kid, Mexican children were educated in Arizona in Mexican schools and Mexican rooms. We wanted to remind the court of this history in Arizona. Um, so these were the questions that we felt needed to be answered and we needed the research to do it. And yes, and this final one. Is sequential instruction okay with Lao? This is really important because this is happening everywhere around the country right now. People are going to English only programs and coming up with various kinds of schemes where the kids really don't have access to the regular curriculum because they don't speak English and the regular curriculum is only provided in English. And so the operating assumption is you're going to spend a lot of time getting these children to be fluent in English, and then they will get access. Well, is that what Lao meant? Do Lao mean that you can spend one, two, three, four, who knows how many years teaching kids English before they get access to the curriculum? Like I say, this is going on in places all over the country. We have never had a decision on this. It's sitting out there. So sitting out there as like an elephant in the living room around all of these programs. So it's an issue that will probably not be, was, well, I won't say that. Um, so these are the questions we set out to answer. And what we did was we commissioned, now I use the word commissioned very liberally because you'll recall that we had a little bit of money from the Foundation for Child Development to hold one meeting. We had no other money. But we knew that this was urgent. We had to have, because they were going back to court. And the decision was going to be made in federal court that if they found this program is okay, the kids are doing fine, it's all right what Arizona is doing. This was a Supreme Court decision. This was going to affect every English learner in the country in one way or another. These are super high stakes. But there was no money. And when we talked with the attorney, who was the lead attorney on the case, he had never had enough money to have a single expert witness. He had never worked with research or researchers because he had no money. So talk about David and Goliath. Here's this legal services uh, lawyer, smart guy, but with no resources, no research on this, and he is going up against the entire state of Arizona and their deep pockets. The superintendent of public instruction can get whatever data he wants. He can, he can have whatever studies he wants done. The state of Arizona, the attorney general, the, I mean, all of them, um, there is no end to what they can do, and we've got this for a legal services lawyer who's never had an expert witness and has no research. So we decided we have to do this. We have to find a way and we have to do this. So we called our friends, the best researchers we knew across the country who were doing research in this area, and over a period of about eight months, we corralled together 21 researchers <coughs> who conducted nine studies, most of these empirical studies, collecting data in, uh, in Arizona on the effects of these programs, what teachers thought, what coordinate, program coordinators thought, um, how they assessed what was going on. And uh, from four universities, those were UCLA, Stanford, uh, University of Arizona, and Arizona State. I have to say that one of the most impressive things I've ever seen was an assistant professor at the University of Arizona, untenured assistant professor, who stuck her neck out, took her, since we had no money, how are we going to do these things? She had a survey research class and a lot of students in it. She put those students in cars. We, we got enough money to pay for gas, okay, for gas. Send her enough money to pay for gas. And they designed surveys and sent students out across Arizona administering these surveys to teachers 
almost 900 teachers across Arizona who were teaching these kids to find out what's really going on. At, and she eventually was attacked incredibly. This is another whole story. That I, I can't take the time to tell you the details of the story, but she was attacked by her own university for doing this. Um, but she stood up to them and she said, you know, right is right. And I am going to court. I don't care what you guys do. She's now leaving the University of Arizona, by the way. I don't care what you guys do. Uh, I'm going to court with this. Um, at Arizona State University, they took teams of students uh, who were in the program there and sent them into, I think it was eight different districts with schools, and sat in the classrooms to see what happened in these classrooms and wrote these lengthy ethnographies about what actually goes on with these kids. So we have 21 researchers in four universities, and in order to be certain that the stuff we had was good, we then went out, that's not true 10, it's 12. Went out and got 12 of the finest experts in the country on this and asked them to review all of this stuff so that we would feel confident um, if it was used by the courts and certainly published by the Civil Rights Project, we could feel confident that this was very credible research. That was with no money. So this is the kind of thing that academics can do if, uh, if they feel the stakes are high and it's a contribution they can make. I cannot say enough about our colleagues who just stepped up to the plate, dropped everything. I mean, this had to be done in a record time and, uh, and pulled this off. I am so incredibly proud of these individuals. What are the outcomes of all of this? We went to court in September of last year, 2010, with our research. The, uh, the lawyers for the state did every single thing they could do to hold get this, um, just get every researcher disqualified and keep the uh, research out of the record. And for the most part, they were successful with various legal maneuvers. That's a more interesting discussion. However, the Department of Justice, because we now have a functioning Department of Justice, and we now have a functioning Office for Civil Rights under the Obama administration, they were shadowing all of this. They were looking at the research that we had produced, and they were using that for their own purposes. And so in the midst of all of this, the Department of Justice came <coughs> in and, uh, and basically told Arizona that they had to stop using the instrument. One of the two studies that we generated were about the instrument they were using to determine whether these kids were fluent in English or not. And they were told, stop. This is not a valid instrument. They had, in the process too, this gets into technicalities that we can discuss later if you want, but um, most kids are, uh, and certainly, like, in most states, in almost every state, children are first identified as English learners through a home language survey. And in most states, there's three questions about the language of the home and the language prepared by the child. Arizona had reduced this down to one question. And they knew when they did that that they would reduce the numbers of kids who would actually be captured into this pool to be assessed. Um, they were told to stop doing that and to go back to a regular home language survey. This was based on another study that we generated. We do not yet know the overall decision. It's supposed to come in April. Today is April 28th. It might be today. It might be tomorrow. In fact, there's a good chance it could be wrong. Um, and then we will know how this all turned out. I worry a lot about it because of the success they had in holding the research out. Okay. If we um, don't prevail on this, if the Florida's decision goes against us, this could allow for the complete segregation of English learners in the separate programs for who knows how long. The denial of access to the core curriculum for these kids. One of the things that we found in these studies that we did was that if you were in high school and you were stuck in one of these four-hour segregated programs, you couldn't take the courses that were required in order to graduate. And so it was a virtual, you know, virtual condemnation. You could not graduate. 
Um, so we, we could get a decision that allows us to do this kind of sequential programming for who knows how long and preventing timely high school graduation. This is kind of the worst case scenario and we're waiting to see. Um, this could become uh, more or less the law of the land. So the moral to my story is <coughs> that rights that are won are not rights that are necessarily retained. Recall mid-1970s, we had a lot of rights for these children. At this point, we may be at we may be at the point of losing every, virtually every last right for English learners. They can slip away without anybody noticing. How many people in the room realized that we had gone <coughs> through this history and that these rights have just been consistently eroded? That researchers can play key roles documenting and calling attention to this erosion. And in fact, maybe it's our responsibility to do that. But we also need to partner with those who can protect and extend those rights. Our research alone, <coughs> sitting in journals, uh, being appreciated by all of our colleagues is a good thing, but it is not sufficient if your concern is for rights. Or <coughs> we may all be Arizona. That's it. So we are waiting to see right now if we all end up in the boat in which Arizona finds itself right now. The studies, oh shoot, I'm sorry about that, that went too fast. All of those nine studies can be downloaded. <coughs> the process, by the way, these will, um, these will all have an academic life, um, and we're in the process of um, publishing them in various other places. But, um, you can get access to all of those nine studies on the Civil Rights Project website and just uh, put in the search Arizona. I don't know what the whole address is. It's just easier to put, you can just put Arizona and they'll pop up. But it, what we called it was the Arizona Educational Equity Project. And you can also see there, and I can actually tell you, I, I think I want to save some time for us to have some conversation, but if you want, I can tell you the titles of all of those studies. Um, it has listed there everybody who participated in the project, the titles of all of those studies, um, and so you can have uh, full access to all of that. So that's my story, and it's a cautionary tale, because um, the rights that we all think are so important and even constitutionally protected are not constitutionally protected if you have a court that wants to um, to find them away. Questions or uh, comments? Uh. And they clearly have no ability to integrate into the other school curriculum at all. And then the classes have an A, B, C, D uh, set of uh, sequences so that you could be in that block in English for two hours in math, A for freshman, B for you know, sophomore and see all the way through your senior year so that you never actually can get out of those plans. And there are tons of kids that are in that right now, even without legislation, you know, making, uh, illuminating how that's an inequitable situation. That's why we need clear legislation that spells out the rights of the kids and what, it, what the responsibilities of schools are to provide for those rights. And in the absence of, as long as you have all this kind of fuzzy stuff, uh, where we're not really defining much of anything, it becomes easy for people to do anything. And uh, given the situation we're in now, it becomes very, very hard to, uh, to get your rights back. Yeah, um, I just said that the, uh, the um, Equal Education Opportunity Act, which has not been repealed, though yeah. it's an issue in this case, uh, it's been had, weakened by this, yes. Yeah, had language in it about basing decisions about re on research. Right. So, given that, how did the lawyers for Arizona get all the research thrown out, and how did they get, I mean, my reading of the research on bilingual ed is that it is quite clearly superior to any kind of energy only. Uh, uh, no, I mean, this There's, is the kind of, yeah, thank so you for how that. how did all this yeah. get thrown out? Thank you for raising that. So 
we have all of these amicus briefs, right? All kinds of organizations that actually reprise this research, although not enough. Really not enough. I think people were not paying enough attention to this, thinking that it was not going to be so much the central issue. But nonetheless, there was plenty of stuff in there for the court to have gone to. They got Eric Hanushek, you know, to say money doesn't matter, right? And they got a couple other people to say that, um, you know, like Christine Russell, <laughs> they cite, you know, as that um, the English, uh, structured English immersion is a superior uh, program. And the court cherry picked those couple things out and used it in the decision, totally ignoring all of the other amicus briefs. So that's what happens when you have the court can use its own discretion. And they use their discretion to choose the couple of studies. Uh, and of course, what always ends up in these things, too, is that, well, it's a quote battle of the researchers, right? Uh, you know, I, I can find any way I want to because there's evidence on all sides. The problem is the evidence is not equal on all sides, but that's too much of a fine point. So the court just went to those and, uh, and, and cites those in the, in the judgment. Does this scare you? <laughs> I hope so. I hope it scares you. Because uh, actually Rachel Moran and I did a, an article a few years prior to this uh, in which we looked at the same thing happening with desegregation. Totally, totally parallel. Totally, almost on the same timeline that we see the height of, of certain rights and then the diminution of those rights and the, and the courts coming in and eroding and eroding until you've got nothing left. Yeah. I'm wondering what uh, the state of politics is or was in Arizona such that, you know, there wasn't voter uh, anguish or backlash. I mean, is the state so gerrymandered that the, the people who are in the affected districts so much don't have as so much boy the vote or is there uh, voice or is there like such dramatic voting patterns? Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Why uh, why there wasn't like pressure on the legislature or, or the, uh, well, maybe not this governor, <laughs> but a prior governor. To Arizona is a very red state. It'll probably be red down to the end. Um, and it, there are very few, even moderate voices uh, in that state. And so it, they are overwhelmed. Um, Raul Grijalva, I think, holds up the banner there. Uh, Tucson tends to be an area that is fairly progressive, but it's an oasis in a red state. And so the political power has not been amassed in that state in, uh, to, uh, to really affect very much. Of course, as you probably noticed, recent decisions by the business community have been tamping down what's been going on in Arizona because they have seen the tremendously negative effects on business. Uh, saying, how oh, cool it, you guys. You know, this is, uh, you know, this is not doing us any good in the state. But um, yeah, if you have state government like that, where do you go? You go to the feds. And we, we are in a moment in which we have some friends, you know, in the Department of Justice. But one more election could change all of that again, too. Don't you think it is incredibly exciting, you guys, that 21 researchers stepped up to the plate and said, this is important. I will find a way to do this research. I will get my students. I will train my students. I will send them out across the state. And we will come up with the data that is needed to actually demonstrate what is going on. I mean, doesn't that get you excited about what the potential is for all of you in this room to make a difference? I mean, we may, who knows, we'll see. Maybe we're going to lose on this one. But you know, if one fantastic thing came out of this, I would like to leave you with the thought that we can organize. And this is very, you know, as I pointed out to you, 12 of the best researchers in the field who you know, are not known for particular bias one way or the other reviewed this stuff. We can organize ourselves around doing the kind of research that makes a difference and that really builds rights for the kids that we worry about. 
So I hope you are, in, you know, in spite of what's kind of a sorry message in many ways, I hope you are inspired by that possibility. Yes. Well, um, just selfishly speaking to the graduate students here, some um, advice that you would give to some of us that are pursuing such research and research that is building off what you all started that will produce some sort of change or or really push legislation in a more equitable way? I think maybe I would have a, a policy seminars uh, organized around these issues, um, raise the issues that you are most concerned about, and consider what kind of research is missing that we need. We're doing a conference next week um, at UCLA, and I'm calling it um, Building on Their Assets. And I've been scouring the country for people who've been doing the kind of research that shows the benefits of incorporating kids' culture and language in their instruction, rather than always being on the defensive about why is this you know, not a problem doing this. I think we need to start doing that kind of research. We need to be, we need to be proactive, we need to be out ahead of the game here rather than responding always to the next terrible challenge coming down the road. But um, we can do it. Oh, oh, oh sorry, <laughs> the other way. Yes. Okay. Are you going to Michelle first? Okay. okay. Um, I was wondering who are the people who, when you're talking about partnering with the people who do have the ability to protect the rights, like who are the people as people like I'm in education, who are the people who we need to be friends with, who can sort of help create these changes? Lawyers. <laughs> you need to hang out in the law school. Yeah. <laughs> Go talk to Chris Edley. Yeah. You know, Chris Edley was um, partnered with Gary Orfield in founding the Civil Rights Project. I mean, Chris is very attuned to how you go about doing this. But, um, yeah, really, I that probably is, you know, you, you want to partner with people who are civil rights organizations that are, will tell you what the big issues are out there and what kind of research that, that needs to be done. You, of course, always want to be careful, and that's why we were very careful about the reviews on this, okay? Because we didn't want to get called on, oh, you guys are just doing slanted stuff. I mean, that, the reviewers' names are all on the page there. You can see who these people are, where they come from, what their credentials are. That's a real important piece here. It, it's got to be good, sound, legitimate research. But I think in this room, we all know that if we do the research well, we have in many cases, not always, sometimes you get big surprises, but in many cases we know what this is going to look like because we've got a lot of years of experience looking at this stuff. You know? But you need to partner with the civil rights organizations or with other rights organizations around your issues. Um, and there are many that are out there on the front lines of this. And one very large one I've got a meeting with next week because we're going to have a new you know, lawsuits, you know, and they get to know you, and they call you. We need research. So, so one shameless plug on this, we're actually having an event on Monday, which is specifically about Mighty Activist as one of our panelists, how do we translate research and That's policy right. advocacy, right. and uh -huh. from 11 to 1, which Jen is so kindly organized as part of our working group in the center. So if folks want to come and get some free food and some good information, please come. No, I think that's not Monday. shameless at all. I think that's wonderful, because if you, you know, if you have the opportunity there to build on this conversation today, I, I would feel so good about that, <laughs> that you're going to do well, that. consider you an honorary <laughs> member of that, of that conversation. But I did have a question to build on Norton's point, which is, so in the appellate court, you had nine studies that you presented to the court. Is that correct? And so in I'm the curious, federal court, not in the federal court. Okay, in the federal So which ones got thrown out and which ones stayed? Just out of curiosity, how did they, and what were, the justifications for okay, here's, exclusion. Here's, That's not getting too technical. Yeah, here, no. <laughs> here's the really sort of sad part of this thing, okay. Our lawyer uh, who had, I mean, I'm, it's always a little bit difficult for me to talk about this in public because I don't know individual motivations or what the particular situation is, but as best I can understand it. Um, the case was supposed to have gone for three weeks in September. It went its three weeks. The <coughs> state still had its parade of witnesses on trial, and the Florida side had still not had its opportunity to bring anyone uh, to um, uh, 
to testify. So the case was then extended into November because the judge, you know, has got a full docket. You know, he can't just say, okay, well, we'll just go through. So he says, okay, the next time I've got space is around Thanksgiving. So they went back to court again in, in uh, November, and the state was allowed to continue with its parade of witnesses from the district. So, you know, and think about this. This is the superintendent of public instruction, okay? He's the guy who holds the purse strings. Tucson had already been told that if they didn't toe the line around ethnic studies, they're getting a 10% cut in their budget. So district folks are very concerned about protecting their resources. So they find this parade of people to come up and say, oh gosh, what we're doing is just fantastic. So they continue doing this through November. The judge says, okay, I've got three weeks in my calendar in January. First two weeks in January, the state continues to bring uh, a parade of witnesses up, and now there is one week left. Our attorney, and this is where the expert witnesses were supposed to get on the stand and introduce the research. So he calls two people from two districts. There is a shooting in Tucson. Um, in which you know, Gabby Gifford's was, and they closed the trial, and that's it. And so none of, all of these people who had learned about this stuff, none of those studies uh, got into the record um, in the case. Well, they got into the record. They just didn't get argued before they the judge. Argue. Yeah, they may get into the record in uh, in one way or another, but they were never argued, and it's not part of the arguments of the case. If we were to get a decision that made the other side unhappy enough, which is not likely, but if that were to happen and they were to take it to the appellate court, then we would be ready again with the studies because we could reintroduce at that point. But um, our the lawyer for Floyd is also was not distressed about this because his, you'll recall me saying, he never worked with expert witnesses. He had never worked with this kind of research. And so he was convinced that, you know, in those two days, well, that in the process that he had dismantled their, the legitimacy of their side enough that it really wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. Through so. his questions. Which I think is doubtful, but. I was going to ask, I was going to ask if you think there's a sort of a window of opportunity to frame the debate around sort of linguistic segregation. Because one of the things that I'm thinking is like, you know, you can take within one school and look at the kids that are in these four hour blocks and compare them to the kids that are in sort of in the mainstream. But oftentimes the entire school is not doing well. And so, so if you compare those kids, you're not going to see a lot of difference. But it's because it's just across the board, very poorly, uh, you know, very poor instruction. So I'm thinking about um, whether or not there's a way to sort of conceptualize or reframe this issue around sort of linguistically segregated spaces and to try to draw links to, um, to sort of individual and aggregate achievement, but to compare across different sites that have different proportions of segregation. Well, I think there might be some sophisticated studies one could do to pull this, you know, to pull this issue out more. But there's a paper in there called The Return of the Mexican Room that was written by Gary Olko and myself, um, in which we make the arguments for triple segregation and how these kids are not only segregated in these situations by poverty and uh, ethnicity, but now, and, and those kinds of segregation are we know there is a ton of evidence that that kind of segrega segregation is terribly harmful to children. But now we're going to overlay that with linguistic segregation by taking them and putting them in a place where they can't even have access to English speakers. So that's sort of the argument that we make there. And I think there's enough evidence out there to, uh, to bolster that argument. One could do some more sophisticated things as well. I'm happy to talk to you about that. Yes? Um. I'd like to thank you for your first speech today. I'm allowed to do this for you. Thank you. Are you telling me to be quiet? <laughs> <laughs> got no, ten I more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to ask. And we'll do that again.
again at the end too, so don't feel like that one. Yeah. Um, so I, um, in my class, we read your chapter in the education crisis on the final point. Is language, is language a problem? Yeah. And um, in the end, I don't, I don't, I, the piece I'm missing from that chapter is ultimately why isn't, why hasn't the federal government given guidance on language instruction? I think your conclusion from that chapter, uh, chapter is that like, they missed an opportunity to study the issue well, and but ultimately, like, what is the re is it because they want the states to save the states' rights ultimately to decide instruction? Or I think it's the same thing you could say about any kind of progressive legislation affecting uh, educational issues. I mean, uh, there has been no will. There has been no strong concern, I think, uh, at the federal level to really clarify these issues because they're messy, you know? Uh, and if you don't feel really strongly about this is a rights issue, why are you going to get yourself in the middle of something that's going to do you no good because you're just bound to make some political enemies in the process? There's a way to uh, interpret your presentation as much as uh, the impetus, impetus of our research rather than its potency. And uh, I guess my question is, uh, are there any activist, you know, and organizational kinds of things going on to put a different kind of pressure on, you know, the uh, courts and, 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 and the state? Because it seems like we're clearly out-resourced and outgunned and out just by one superintendent who may, you know, have a different objective than all of these, than, than, than anything that the research says. You know, try my, my first, for the first couple of days after this, I just went around holding my head. You know, because this had been really pretty much a 24-hour day, seven day a week, year and a half kind of almost compulsion, you know, uh, around this. And then to have it sort of what seems like a whole fizzle on you and uh, <coughs> that this is one of the reasons why when Lisa asked me if I would come and talk, I said yes without a pause because I think that one way is I'm going to go to Stanford tomorrow and I'm going to do the same thing and I just came from Notre Dame and I did the same thing. And, you know, I think one way is to get the word out so that people know understand what's at stake here and know that there is a body of research out there that they can go to. Um, we're also working in a number of ways. So I've got somebody very prominent writing um, uh, a legal journal article on this so that lawyers, when they go searching for this kind of thing, are going to find the research in there. We're, we're working on a number of different things. In the, I think the problem is, is there will be no shortage of opportunities to address these things again in the future. I have no doubt. I mean, there, these are ongoing issues that are, they won't be resolved in Arizona. And maybe we'll win on the next one. Well, to, to just push the issue slightly further, mm -hmm. what you described is not very different from what Jeannie Oates has described about the basic issue of tracking. And this is like 1980 <laughs> when our phenomenal work came out. So. The research is already in place that shows that when you put people in segregated uh, situations with you know, similar skills, they're gonna fall further and further behind. So we have like three decades of knowing that and to sort of then have it come up under uh, you know, sort of bilingual issues and it's the same issue. And now what I was sort of describing is all uh, kids who are in schools who are not performing at the level that they should on language <laughs> On language test. There's a California test that you know they administer every year, and if kids don't get a certain level of proficiency, they go into this quote unquote strategic English class, or it's called inside English class, and it's exactly the same issue. Mm -hmm. So it seems like you know after 30 years of having research that clearly indicates that that's not going to help. Uh, something else needs to be done beyond research. Well, we don't take on easy issues. Um, I mean, none of us in the room. I mean, we don't take on the easy stuff, right? Um, and we're going to lose some, you know, before we win some. But I just believe that you have got to continue to um, raise people's consciousness and uh, and build teams. And I think that I, I think that the academy is one place that very legitimately can be involved in informing folks about these things, and that we simply must do that more. 
Um, we all know about Jeannie's research, but I don't know how many people outside of our groups know about Jeannie's research. Um, we need to do a better job of connecting with the folks who, you, who can use this stuff and move it forward in courts and in regulatory environments. Um, and unfortunately, I think those of us who are concerned about these issues have to do it really quick because in the history, we get very small windows of opportunity <laughs> to do this. So you can't wait around and wait for the, you know, the next administration that might be um, uh, interested in hearing your voice. So go out and get them. <laughs> we have time for one final question. Michael, you want to be our last word? Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, I noticed in 2005 in your chronology, there was $2 million a day, and then nothing happened until 2006. I was wondering, uh, did they ever have to pay? Did, who did it go to if that, that money ever went anywhere? Or, or they never paid as far as I know. I believe what they did is they lodged a you know, counter suit and that you know, stayed the issue you know, until it's heard again by the court. And so you know, these, these things were always done in that fashion. You know, like just under the wire, you know, they arrive at court you know, with some papers mm. and so, okay, they're off again. And that's what happened between 1992 and 2000 as well. Mm. You know, it was just at every point, okay, we're, we're, we're here, Judge. You know, so. mm. Sophia, did you want to just ask Yeah, me um, you said that Arizona was told to stop using their language assessment. Did they actually stop using it and what's the status of it now? You know what, I can give you the details on the home language survey. I understand that they actually stopped. And they, are, added uh -huh, and, to they, and they added uh, two questions back, but they didn't add the same questions back. And so now there is uh, a new controversy about the order in which they asked them and exactly the language, and that's still brewing. The Azela, they are continuing to use, but the uh, Department of Justice has given them a, a little bit of time on that one. I think by 2014, they have to have a new instrument, and it has to be validated and all of this. Of course, by that time we'll have Common Core and we'll be a whole new thing, and you know, God knows, you know, where all of this is going to end up. But they are supposed to be doing something around this. But as far as I know, they've done nothing so far, and the court's sitting there waiting to see what Arizona's going to do. With that, I'd like you guys to join me in thanking Patricia for a wonderful. <laughs>